Hi, Ben. Hi, Caleb. No, we need to do that. I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes till a few more people get in here.
All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, we were on section <clears throat> 6.3 and I had only gotten to um, problem number, the very first, my math lab problem that I had was number two. So we're ready to go to number four and it's just matching. Um, and I always start with the base graph, which would be this one right here. Um, we had covered exponential graphs, which are in the form of y is equal to a to the x. And those graphs always go through 0, 1. So the graph runs along the x-axis. It goes through 0, 1 and then shoots up. It's an exponential graph. <clears throat> and the base can be any number. It happens to be an eight on this one. So basically I'm looking for that graph right there. And that one will be number 41, which is right here. So I would click on the Y equals A to the X, click it and drag it and drop it into this box right here. Now, it's just, you know, a guessing game at this point. Um, I would probably go after, the next one I would go after would be this one because it's the same basic 8 to the x, but they put a negative in front of it. And remember when they put a negative in front of it, it's going to flip it around the x-axis. So instead of going through 0, 1, it's going to be going through zero, negative one. So I'm looking for that graph that looks like that. And zero, negative one, the only one that looks like that is number 42. So it's this one here. So that's this graph. I'll just color code. So just click on it and drag it down to there. Next. Um, let's see, instead of that negative being on the eight, if I look at the negative being on the exponent, when that happens, it spins like a weather vane. So that one would still go through the zero one, but it would look like this. It flips like that. So that would be choice 37. It would be this one right here, like that. Okay, and then what else have I got here? Um, all right, I've got this one down here, which puts the negative on both the eight and the X. So it would be doing both the pink and the blue. It would flip upside down and then flip around. So it's like it goes from the perp or sorry, <laughs> the yellow to the pink for this negative here. And then it would flip like a weather vane. So it would end up looking like this for that negative right there. So I am looking for that graph, which would go through zero, negative one, and that would be this one right here. Oop. That's this graph. So click and drag and drop it in this box. And next, let's see. Um, this one here says uh, it's y equals eight to the x, and then it's a minus one. So that's gonna be the yellow graph. It starts with the yellow graph, but then because of the minus one, it's gonna drop the yellow graph down one. So instead of it going through zero, one, it'll go through zero, zero. It'll be the origin. So it's gonna run along here and go up. So I'm looking for one that goes in, that looks like that going through the origin. 
and it has to it will no longer run along the x-axis it'll drop down one so the asymptote is now down one so it's this one right here 38 and 43 look similar it's just that 43's asymptote because you can see the purple one here drops below the x-axis so that's this one all right what other colors have i got how about orange um this one says y to the y equals eight raised to the x minus one okay so when the minus one is up in the exponent it shifts left or right the purple one the minus one was like next to the function of a to the x so if it's a plus one or minus one it goes up or down but if the plus one or minus one is in the exponent it'll go left or right so the starting with the yellow graph it's going to go since it says minus one it'll go one to the right so now instead of going through zero one it's going to go through one one it'll still be along the x-axis and then it'll shoot up like that so that is going to be this one 38 38 still runs along the x-axis and you can see it's going through it's going through one one right here so that's that one and now i'm down to the last two so it's a 50 50 shot here um let's see i would probably look at the this one here now it's written one minus eight to the x but that's the same thing as saying negative eight to the x plus one so if you start with the yellow the negative in front of the eight to the x will flip it upside down which would make it the pink but then you have a plus one. So the pink one is gonna go up one. So this will go up one and it'll cross the origin. And now my colors are getting so bent out of shape. It would go up one and cross the origin. It's gonna be number 40. And now the asymptote is no longer the x-axis, it's up one. So this is the gray one. And which by the process of elimination, the last one you have, <laughs> the only one that's left, uh, which is this one, he'd be last and obviously he's going to go here. But if you look at it, it's eight to the one minus X, which is the same thing as a negative X plus one. The negative X would spin it like a weather vane and then the plus one would make it go actually you'd have to pull out the negative which would make it go one to the left it'd be negative x plus one so you'd factor it out and it would really be eight to the negative x minus one whoops didn't mean to drop that there you go X minus one, and it ends up being this one. It's, it's, it's the yellow, you start with the yellow, but because it's a negative on the exponent, it spins it like a weather vane, 180 degrees. And then because you have an X minus one, it's gonna move it one to the right. So instead of going through zero one, it's now going through right here, one zero. Okay. So you got a couple like that where it's just basically matching. Have fun. And then you're gonna go to the next one where you're gonna have to use the graphing tool in my math lab. And the graphing tool, when you look at your little toolbox, you're looking for the box that has this little picture in it. That's the exponential graph. Looks like that. So use the graphing tool, all right? This is the graphing tool.
Um, and when you do that, actually, I can show you. Let me go to my math lab assignment number 6.3. We're doing number eight, which I've already done. So I'll have to um, click on similar question. There we go. Similar question. Okay. So it says use the graphing tool. Um, you can click on this to enlarge it. You're going to click on this symbol right here. That's the exponential. And then just click anywhere on the graph. And this shows up. Oops, get this out of the way. This is the basic A to the X. I don't know what the base is, any base. They've got actually they've got it set for five to the X. And then when you're looking at the equation, it just says plus three. So I have to take that graph that's in yellow and apply the plus three to it. That means it's gonna shift vertically up one, two, three, and it moves it for you. Click on it to make it blue, hit save and check answer and you get a positive affirmation, woohoo! So that's how that works. Hope you saw that. And then it goes on to ask the other questions. So on this one, it was four to the X plus five. Again, I'll do the original graph in yellow. Um, the yellow would go through zero one, would have an asymptote as the X axis, and then it would go something like that. But that's the, that's the four to the X part. If I want to bring in the plus five part, that is gonna move from here up, one, two, three, four, five. And now the asymptote is actually five. It runs along the Y, uh, the horizontal line of Y equals five and then shoots up. So pink is my final answer. Pink is final answer. And then it says, what's the domain? Well, this thing spreads out across the entire x-axis. It goes to the left, and I know it looks like it's going up, but as it's going up, it's also going out. So type your answer in interval notation for the entire x-axis, negative infinity to positive infinity. Now the range is different. The range of the pink graph, this graph doesn't drop below. You have a horizontal asymptote right here going through five. So there are no y, there are no points with y coordinates of a five. Gets real close to it, but doesn't hit it. So you're gonna use a parenthesis to say, start at five, but don't include it. And then of course this thing does keep going up so it goes to infinity. And then they ask you, well, what is that horizontal asymptote? And it says, type an equation, type an equation. All horizontal lines are always y is equal to wherever it's crossing the y-axis and it's crossing it at five. And then it says, last question at the bottom, what is the y-intercept? This thing crosses the y-axis here. Remember, it was at one and it went up five. That lands it at six. And it doesn't want an ordered pair, so just say six. That's all it asked for. So that was number eight. Number nine, same basic thing. Um, if you start with the basic graph of y is equal to four to the x, that would be this graph, runs along here, goes through zero, one, and shoots up. But then if you bring into play the four to the negative x, now we're looking at the negative part, um, since the X is negative, it'll spin it like a weather vane. So that's now going to make it be doing this. Oops. 
And then the last part is to bring in the minus one. So the blue graph will now drop down one, go down one so it'll cross here. And the green graph is my final graph. Of course, in my math lab, you'll have to tell it to reflect around, reflect around the y-axis. This is reflect around y-axis. And then this is a vertical shift in green. Okay. And then they ask you for the domain. The domain for any of these, they spread out across the entire x-axis. So that's always negative infinity to positive infinity. The range, however, is where your asymptote is. I'll put the asymptote in red on this one. My asymptote, it started as the x-axis, but remember you dropped it down one. So um, that's my new asymptote, which means my graph never goes below that. So my range can be no smaller than, well, one. Oh, sorry, negative one. I'm below the x-axis. You start at negative one, but don't include it. And then this graph, the green graph, is still, it's still going upwards. So that's to infinity. And then the horizontal asymptote would be the equation y equals negative one. And then they want to know where the y-intercept is. And the y-intercept is where it crosses the y-axis. That's the origin. So zero. You guys got any questions on those so far? Okay, um, begin with a graph of y equals e to the x. Remember e is 2.718 blah, 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 blah. It looks just like any other exponential function. Um, you start with y is equal to e to the x and it just runs along here, goes through 0, 1 and then goes up because if x is zero, anything to the zero power equals one. So exponential graphs always go through this point right here. And then what they do from that is they do a plus one onto the x. So in the exponent, so when it's up in the exponent, that's gonna shift it left or right. So the plus one is a horizontal shift to the left. Remember, it's always the opposite. So it's going to go one over to here. I'm still going to have the same asymptote, but my graph's just going to curve up a little quicker like that. Boop. So the blue is my final graph. All right. Uh, the domain is still negative infinity to positive infinity. Um, the range, again, this just went left or right. The horizontal asymptote didn't change, so it doesn't drop below zero. So it starts at zero, but doesn't include it, and then goes up, and the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. And that takes care of the graphing portion. All right, so... Then we went to solving exponential equations, and these are always fun to do. Um, the concept that you needed was if, and I can't remember what letters they used, but I always say if x to the a equals x to the b, then your a has to equal your b. You just drop the bases. If the bases are the same, you can just drop them. 
And that means the exponents, is, the exponents are the same. They're equal to each other. And when I look at this problem, I've got a five to the X equals a five to the four. So X has to equal four. And my math lab just wants a solution set. So all you're gonna stick inside here is the number four. That's it. Now the next one, the bases are not the same. The base on the left is a three and the base on the right is a nine, but nine is three squared. So I'm going to make them the same base. And now I have an X to the this equals an X to the that. So my this is equal to my that. And if negative X equals a positive two, then a positive X equals a negative two. You would just divide by a negative invisible one. So the solution set is negative two. That's it. And of course, they get more complicated as you go along. Of course. Um, on this one, same deal. I've got a three raised to the five X plus one. It's set equal to a nine. I have to change nine to base three and I can do it. That is a three squared. And then it's at this point, since you have a three to the five X plus one and it equals a three to the two, you literally can just drop the threes and take the exponents and set them equal to each other and then just solve for X. Uh, I would subtract one first, so that cancels. I get five X is equal to one. And then I'm gonna divide both sides by five so that those cancel. And I've got X is equal to one fifth. Ta-da! And that's what I'll put right here. Just the one fifth, not the X equals two. Just wants the solution set. Just the number. Okay, now on those last couple of examples, they both had base three. One of the uh, one of the bases was a three. So I only had to mess with the other base, which was a nine. But sometimes you have to mess with both bases. 64 is not a base 32 number because 32 to the first is 32. 32 to the second is like 900 and blah, blah, blah. Um, you have to change them both to base in this case, they are both base two numbers. Let me just rewrite the original problem here. Okay. So instead of the 32, I'm going to replace my 32 with a two to the fifth. Because two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16, times two is 32. And then times another two would be 64. So 64 is a two to the sixth. And now I have to use the fact that I have a power raised to a power. And that rule said, if you have X to the A and it's raised to the B power, you just simply take the A times the B. So this is going to become two raised to the five times the negative X plus 44. And over here, this will become two to the sixth times the X. Has it got a power to a power? So what I really have here is two raised to the, and you're gonna distribute the five here. So that's gonna be negative five X plus, what's that, 220. And that's gonna equal two raised to the six times X is six X. 
And now you can just drop the twos. You can go back to the, if you've got an X to the this and it equals an X to the that, the this equals the that. So I'm just gonna take the negative 5X plus 20 and set it equal to the 6X. I literally just drop out the twos. Um, to solve for X, I got more X's on the left. So, or I got more positive X's on the right. So I'm gonna get rid of the X's on the left. And I just realized I forgot to copy my 220. Sorry, I wrote just 20 here. This should be a 220, there we go. All right, so the five X is cancel on the left and I'm left with 220 is equal to 11 X. And then I'll divide by 11 so that the 11s cancel and I get 20. 20 is equal to X, so my solution set is 20. All right, it's gonna get even more complicated. Okay, um, I've got a base five on the left, right? Here's, this is my base five. And over here, this is a base 25. 25 is five squared. So I'm gonna leave the left side as five raised to the X squared minus 20. But the right side, instead of 25 to the 2x, I'm going to change that 25 and make it a 5 squared. Left side, nothing. Right side, you have a power. You have a power raised to another power. So you're going to multiply those together. So this is going to be 5 to the 2 times 2x is a 4x when I multiply those. And now I've got a 5 to the this equals a 5 to the that. So I can just drop my 5s and take the exponent of x squared minus 60 and set that equal to the exponent of 4x. And now I got to solve this equation. It started out as an exponential and now it's a quadratic. Oh, what fresh hell is this? All right, so now I have to remember how do you solve quadratic equations? Oh yeah, set them equal to zero and hope that they factor because if they don't, I'm gonna have to use the quadratic formula with A, B, and C. So on this one, um, I would subtract the 4x on both sides. So that's gonna give me x squared. I would put the subtract 4x right there. And then the minus 60 is equal to, and of course that cancels, so you get zero. And this unfoils, yay! It's an x squared, so it's x and x. And then it ends in a negative 60 right? It ends in a negative 60. So I need two factors of 60 that add up to negative four. So my factors are one times 60, two times 30, three times 20, four times 15, five times 12. Ah, here we go. Six times 10. There they are. And I would need a positive six and a negative 10 to add up to the negative four. So I'm gonna put a positive six and a negative 10 right there. And my two possible answers for X, this X would have to be a negative six and this X would have to be a positive 10. And either one of them works. They do both check if you are so inclined to plug them and chug them. They do both work. Well, that was fun. 
And number 22 gets us back to exponential functions. It says, suppose that g of x is equal to 7 raised to the x power plus 3. What is g of negative 1? So I'm going to start with part A. What is g of negative 1? All right, so g of x is 7 to the x plus 3. We want to calculate g of negative 1. So that's going to be 7 to the negative 1 plus 3. Well, 7 to the negative 1 is the same as 1 over 7 to the positive 1, which is just 1 7th. And 1 7th plus 3 would be 3 and 1 7th. But they want type integers or fractions. They didn't say mixed numbers. So 7 times 3 is 21 plus one more. That'd be 22 sevenths. So 22 sevenths goes here. And then it says the, the point blank is on the graph of F. Uh, they're asking for a point, so they want an ordered pair. So our ordered pair would be the X coordinate was negative one. And then we just found the answer is the 22 sevenths. All right, and then part B says, if G of X equals 52, what is X? Well, once again, g of x is equal to 7 to the x plus 3. And they said if g of x is 52. So you're going to take out all of g of x and put 52 in its place. So 52 equals 7 to the x plus 3. And now I got to solve this for x. Um, it's an exponential, so I have to get the exponential part by itself. So I would start by subtracting the 3. Let me separate my work here. And then let's see, 52 minus 3 is 49. And over here, that cancels, so you're left with 7 to the x. And since the base on the right is a 7, is 49 a base seven number? Yes, it is. It's a seven squared. So a seven to the second equals a seven to the X. So the two is equal to the X. Boom. So if G of X is equal to 52, then X is equal to two. And then the point two blank or two comma, and they gave us the Y coordinate that was 52 is on the graph of G. And I've got one more example in here and it's a word problem. And I also noticed that I typed the wrong number. This is not 25, this is number 24. Sorry about that. Number 24. The price P in dollars of a specific car that is X years old is modeled by the function below. P of X is equal to 22,275 times 0.88 to the X. The 22,000 number, that was the original price of the car. Because if X is zero, if you put a zero right here, you would have 22,275 times 0.88 to the zero. And order of operations, if I take 0.88 to the zero, that's just a one. That's just the number one. So I'm getting $22,275 is the price of the car the moment it comes off the lot. It's brand new. It's a baby, zero years old. However, five years later, how much should the five year old car cost? You're now going to put 
five where X is. So now I'll put the five right here. So this is going to be 22,275 times 0.88 raised to the fifth power. And on your all's calculator, I think I showed you this the other day. Go back to slide 25. Yep. Remember, this is your Y to the X button right here. This is how you'll do your exponent on this. And you can literally type it in as you see it. I would type in the 22,000, like type that into your screen. And then I would literally hit a parenthesis. Then I would hit the 0.88. Then I would close the parenthesis. Then I would hit that Y to the X button. Then I would hit a five. And then I would hit enter. And it does say round to the nearest whole number as needed. If you do it correctly and you round it, you should get 11,755.2, so 55. And then an eight-year-old car, um, I would simply take the eight and plug it in here. <clears throat> so when I do that one, it's done exactly the same way. This time you get 8,010.8, so it will go up to 11. You can see the car is depreciating fast. So cho choice, choose, Woo! part C, choose the correct answer below. Um, as each year passes, the car is worth 0.12% of its value the previous year. As the year, as each year passes, the car is worth 88% of its value the previous year. As each year passes, the car is worth 12%. When they put that 0 0.88 in there, 0 0.88, 0 0.88 is the same thing as 88%. So it would not be this one. 0.88 does not mean 0.88%. It means 88%, this one here. So it's worth 88% of its value from the previous year. So like the second you drive it off the lot, it's already lost. Uh-oh, my web route popped up. Well, there we go. It's already lost. It's lost 12% of its value. It's not worth 12%. It's lost. So it's worth 88%. All right. So that takes care of 6.3. And we're now going to cover 6.4, which is the inverse of exponential, which is logarithmic. So let me switch PowerPoints. There we go. Section 6.4, there are four objectives. Um, we're going to change exponential statements to logarithmic statements and the reverse, go from logs to exponential. I always make a joke that we're going to we're leaving exponent land. We're traveling to log land. Uh, we're also going to evaluate logarithms. We're going to graph logarithms and we'll solve logarithmic equations just like we solved exponentials. So let's start with how do you convert from exponential to logarithmic? And here is the rule. <clears throat> y equals log base A of X <clears throat> if and only if X equals A raised to the Y power. Okay, so I'm going to write down the x is equal to a raised to the y. That was what we've been doing, exponential stuff. The base is a, the exponent is y, the answer is that x over there. And then what they wrote was y equals log base a of x. I've seen lots of different letters. I've seen some books that like to use M and N and P. As long as you have the same three letters, you can see how they switch positions. So they're using X's, A's, and Y's. Now, when you are in exponent land, this A right here, they call that the base. 
Well, in log land, logarithms also have bases. This is called log base A. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the base is the same in both exponent land and log land. Whatever is where that A is, if it's a two, you'd have log base two. Then the exponent, the Y right here is my exponent. <clears throat> Logarithms are exponents. Logarithms, I'll just say logs, logs are exponents. That's really what logarithms are. And since your log base A of X is set equal to the Y, you can see that the Y is the answer to the log and it is the exponent when it's in exponent land. And then the only thing you have left is the third letter, which is the X. And so over in exponent land, the X is actually in the answer position. You'd have to figure out A raised to the Y to get the X. So over here, you have to take the log base A of the X to get the Y. The same three letters, just in different positions. And whenever I'm converting from exponential to logarithm, logarithmic, um, I always start with the base because it makes the most sense. I'm like, okay, I know what the base is. And then I have to remember that logarithms should always equal whatever the exponent was when it was in exponential form. And then there's only one letter left, so it's got to go there. So here's their examples. It says changing, and I uh, cut and pasted their little rule up there of y equals log base a of x if and only if x equals a to the y. So I always start with the exponent or the base. What color did I use for the base? Uh, pink. So I'm like, okay, here's my base, the 1.2. So this is going to have to be log base 1.2. And then I know it has to equal the exponent. The exponent was a three. So that three, that three right here has to go here. And then the only thing I have left is the M and that's gonna go right here. That will be what you're taking um, the logarithm of. So this is going to be log base 1.2 of m is equal to 3. Now when you're in my math lab, um, let me show you this real quick. Whenever you type the letters L-O-G, my math lab will not see them as variables. It'll automatically recognize that you're doing logarithms. So let's see. I've already number number two, but I'll do it again. We hit similar question. They want me to change it to an equivalent log. So I would start by typing L O. And right now it looks just like L O, but watch what happens when I hit G. It bolds it. So it automatically recognizes these aren't variables. This is a logarithm. And now the base is the seven. Now go down to your toolbox and there is a subscript tool right here. Subscript, click on that and it'll put a base in there for you and it would be base seven. Now be careful. Before you start typing again, hit your arrow over button to get it out of the base. And I need to type the 49 right here because I have to set it equal to the exponent of two. Good job. Well done. Excellent. You're beautiful. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me go back to here. All right, the next one 
says um, e to the b equals nine. Well, we haven't even talked about that yet. Hang on, let me see what there says. Oh, they okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> okay. During their examples, since they haven't talked about natural logarithms yet, they just left this as base e and they said, all right, it's going to be log the base is e of the nine and it has to be set equal to the exponent of b. So the nine goes here. The base was e that goes here. And then of course the exponent is b and that's what the logarithm should be set equal to. And you can either type in log base e of nine equals b or b equals log base e of nine. It's the same thing. In a few minutes we're going to learn what e, that e actually has his own special logarithm because he's a special base. All right and then the last one it's log base a of the 24 has to equal the exponent of four. My exponent has to be the answer equal to the logarithm. They'll have the exact same base. The a is the base in exponent form. The a is the base in log form. And then the only thing I have left is this 24. So whatever the answer is in exponential form, that's what you're taking the log of in log form. And of course, here's the next slide just shows their answer. So I'm not going to put my colors on all of that. And then the next example is let's go backwards. They give them to you in log form and they want you to convert them to an equivalent statement involving an exponent. So we're going to leave log land and travel back to exponent land. And I would still always start with my bases. The base on part A is an A. The base on part e, B is the E. And on part C is the three. That's what I would start with. That'd be my base on all of these. If you're going backwards, I would say base A, base E, base three, and then it's going to be raised to an exponent, right? It's going to be raised to the power of something on all of these. And what goes in that position is whatever the logarithm is set equal to. So here it would be a to the five, here it would be e to the negative three, and this would be three to the c. And then basically it's just going to equal the only thing you have left. So this is going to equal to four. This is going to equal to B and this is going to equal to five. Because there's three pieces to each. And here's their examples. There's their answers to the solutions or there's their solutions to whatever. All right. <laughs> So what I did on this one is I went ahead and went over this and then went straight to the my math lab um, examples here, you know, it's like I'm doing each section, each objective and going straight to the my math lab examples. So um, we're going to change this one to a logarithm. All right. Change the exponential statement to an equivalent statement involving a logarithm. So it's going to be log base eight. Remember, you start with the base. The base is an eight. So that's what's going to go right here. Of the 4096, because it has to set equal to the four, because logarithms always equal the exponent. The exponent is four and that's what goes there. That's my answer and I'm sticking to it. it goes right in there in that box. Or you can write it four equals log base eight of 4096. It doesn't matter. When you have an equal sign, the crap on the left always equals a crap on the right. It doesn't matter which side the crap's on. 
Uh, number three, this one says, change the exponential statement to an equivalent logarithmic again. So exponential to a logarithm. So I just start by typing L-O-G. And then the base is, in this case, an A. I just look up here and I'm like, what's the base? It's an A. That's what goes right here as a subscript on the log. And then it's going to be log base A of the 7.9 is equal to the exponent of 4. Logarithms always equal the exponent. So that goes right there. Um, <sighs> okay, um, I guess you can use LOG and it won't care. I typed in LN and it gave it to me. Um, LOG, regular logs, these are called, it's called a common logarithm. And if you don't see a number here, like if it says log of seven like that, that is the same thing as saying log base 10 of seven. There are a lot of invisible numbers in math. Um, most of you are used to the invisible one um, there's lots of invisible ones. Like if I'm looking at the letter X, there is an invisible one here. There's an invisible one there. And there's one more, the denominator, right? But if your answer is X, you just write X. You don't write one X to the first over one. No, because X to the first is X. One times X is X and X divided by one is X. Those are invisible. Um, the square root sign, if I said the square root of X, there's an invisible number on that also. It's this two right here. If it were a cubed root, you'd see the three. If it were a fifth root, you'd see the five. But only the square root has the invisible two. And then there is the log. If you have log of, I don't know, 10, well, not 10, makes them up. Let's say they want the log of N and you don't see a number here, this is the invisible 10. Now those are common logarithms. If you have base E, base E belongs to LN or lowercase LN, which is called the natural logarithm. And this always bugged me. If it's a natural logarithm, then why is it LN? Shouldn't it be NL? Get it? Natural logarithm. Shouldn't it be NL? I don't know why. Why is it LN? So I'm, I'm always like, well, it's just a logarithm L natural. Feel free to laugh amongst yourselves. Okay. Anyway, this is always base E. So whenever you see the LN, there's actually an invisible base E right there. They will never write it, but it's there. Okay. So <clears throat> when I see base E to the X power, as soon as I see this base E right here, I'm all about, okay, that's a natural log. It's going to be natural log, which is base E right there, but it will be invisible. And then that's going to equal, whoops, it's going to be the natural log base E of the 13, and it'll be equal to the exponent of X. That's still in there. That hasn't gone anywhere.
exponent is that. But the E is truly invisible. It really is. So inside this box here, and I'll put it in a different color, I would type the ln of 13 is equal to x. That's what I'd put in that box. Because um, when I was doing these, that's what, you know, I just typed it in. But I think it'll also take log base e of 13 is equal to x. It'll take that also. I'm pretty sure. I didn't double check it, but. All right, so that's converting from exponential to logarithmic. And now let's put our brains in reverse and go backwards. Now they're going to give you something in log form and they want you to write it as an equivalent statement involving an exponent. I still start with the base. The base is two. It's base two raised to some power. And the power is always whatever your logarithm is set equal to. So this is going to be a three. And then the only thing you have left is the eight. And of course, on this one, you can actually see that that's a true statement. This one didn't have any variables. Two to the third, that's two times two times two. That does equal eight. So this is what I'd type in this box right there. Um, next, again, start with the base. I've got log base eight. So that's my base. And that's gonna be raised to a power of here, whatever the logarithm is equal to. So it's base eight raised to the X will equal the only other number left, which is the 64. Hmm. And here's number eight, uh, change the logarithmic statement to an equivalent statement involving an exponent. And here they just kind of threw the LN at you. But you have to remember when you see ln of five is equal to x, your base is right here. So you have to remember that that is the invisible e, but it's not invisible now because it's in, you know, you're going to exponent land. And it's going to be raised to the power of whatever the logarithm was set equal to, which was x. So x goes right here, and then it's going to equal to that 5. Invisible e right there. All right, so that takes care of that part. All right, the next objective is evaluating logarithmic expressions. That means figuring them out. All right, it says find the exact value of log base 2 of 16. They want to know what does log base 2 of 16 equal? Okay, well, when I'm looking at it, I ask myself, okay, Log base two of 16 is equal to what? Well, that's in log form. In exponent form, it would be base two to the what equals 16. Two to what power is 16? My what power is two times two is four times two is eight times two is 16, that was four. Two to the fourth is 16, so log base two of 16 is four. And then same thing over here, log base three of one over 27 is equal to what? <laughs> Sorry. So it's base three to the what would equal one over 27. Okay, so three to the what equals one over, I'm gonna change my 27 to a base three number. 
I'm actually solving this exponentially. All right, so 27 is 3 cubed, but 1 over 3 cubed is the same as 3 to the negative 3. And now you can see that your bases are the same. I have a 3 to the this equals a 3 to the that. So my question mark is actually equal to negative 3. The answer to this thing here is negative 3. Because remember, logarithms are really exponents. So I convert it to exponential form and solve it. The next slide shows their, their work on how they did it, but it was very similar to mine. They just used the letter Y instead of a question mark. Which brings me to the My Math Lab examples. And the first one, number nine, is actually a trick question. It says, evaluate the expression without using a calculator. Truth be told, you can't use a calculator because that LOG button on your calculator will only do base 10. There's actually a formula you need in order to do it. And we haven't covered that yet. So you have to look at this and say to yourself, all right, I've got log base nine of one is equal to what? So I start with the base, the base is nine. And I'm like, okay, nine raised to the what should equal the one. Nine to what power equals one whole? That question mark should equal zero. Anything to the zero power equals one. So zero is my answer there. Uh, log base three of 27. Um, again, I always start with the base because they want to know log base 3 of 27 is equal to what, right? We're like, what is this equal to? So take the base of 3 and ask yourself 3 to the what power equals 27? Wouldn't that be 3 to the third? 3 to the what is equal to 3 to the third. 27 is 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27. So the answer is 3. 3 is my answer. That goes in my box. All right, and one more example of this. This is a little tougher. My base here is a one half. All right. And I'm going to use a variable on this one instead of a question mark. Remember, you're going to take your base. You're going to raise it to a power and then it's gonna equal something. Well, my base in this problem is the one half. Since it's a fraction, all of it gets raised to, this is my answer, right? I don't know what it is, so I'm gonna just call it X. Instead of a question mark, I'll put an X. And that equals the 128. I need to solve this exponentially, so, the one half is actually going to, I'm going to, if you remember the, the rule that if you have one over a to the x, that's the same thing as, let me use b instead, a to the b, that's the same as a to the negative b. If you flip it to its reciprocal, its exponent becomes negative. And my exponent down here is really a positive one. So this is gonna flip over to be two to the negative one raised to the x. And of course the power to a power, negative one times x would be negative x. And then what I need to do is change 128 to a base two number, hope I have enough fingers. Two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16, times two is 32, times two is 64 times two is 128. I've got seven fingers showing up. So I don't know if you guys can see me or not. Um, so I get two to the seventh in place of my 128. And now if 
two to the this equals two to the that. My this equals my that and divide by negative one and you get negative seven. And negative seven goes in this box right there. <sighs> now, the next part covers graphing log functions and logarithms are the inverse of exponential graphs. So their graph is a reflection around the y is equal to x diagonal. So um, I really wish they would have b first and a second, but whatever, um, because your normal exponential graph is this one here, which goes through 0, 1, and then shoots up. The x-axis is your asymptote. If you fold that paper along this line right here, which should be dashed, I don't like the way they've graphed this, which is the y equals x, then you get the logarithm, which is on the other side, which is over here. That's the graph of a logarithm. And this is for when A, which is your base, is greater than one whole. So they would be whole numbers or improper fraction bases. This one over here is when A is between 0 and 1 or if your exponent is negative. Um, the graph for that this is y is a to the technically negative x. It flips it around, you know, it's like a, um, a weather vane. But when you flip it around the diagonal y equals x, which again is this line right here to get the reflection, the inverse, which is the logarithm, it'll flip around that point right there and it'll look like that. So um, the properties of logarithmic functions, the domain, the domain is actually zero to infinity, and the range is negative infinity to infinity, which is the opposite of exponential. When you're doing the y equals a to the x, which is this graph here, and it goes whoop like that. The domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range doesn't drop below the x-axis unless you shift it, and it goes from zero to infinity. You can see they're reversed here. The domain is zero to infinity, and the range is negative infinity to infinity. They're just opposite. Um, on, on the exponential, it has a y-intercept on of 0, 1, but on logarithms, it's an x-intercept at 1 and no y-intercept. <clears throat> um, so basically, it's just, they're still smooth and continuous, but, you know, it's just the reverse of all that. And then this is the graph of the natural log of x, which is, if they use the calculator, they get these values here. But after they graph it, you can still see that e to the x, which is this blue graph, when you do the inverse, which would be the natural log, you get the red graph. If you folded it along, this dotted, dot, well, it's not dashed, but that black line there, they're mirror images of each other. And then they did one more with base 10. They just, these are just examples where you can see the, the exponential graph and the logarithmic graph, it's equivalent. So, and then when I got to your, my math lab examples, there's I think four of them. I just did one, it's this again, where you, you know, grab the correct graph and drop it in. So I always start with the base, the base graph of, log of x, which would be this one here. 
doesn't matter what base it is. It's base nine. It can, you could have base sevens or base fives, but just the log base whatever of X. And I'm looking for, you know, that graph that looks like it's going to go through zero one and the log graph looks like this. Now the Y axis is the asymptote. Exponential, it's the X axis. You want the Y axis. So that's going to be looking at all my choices. It is actually this one right here because it goes through zero or one zero. So it's that one. And then I just kind of go through it the way I did before. Um, what would I choose next? I'd probably grab this one. This one says, negative log base not of x. If you put a negative in front of the function, it's going to flip it around the x-axis. So this yellow graph is going to flip and do that. So I'm looking for that one and still has to go through 0, 1. And that ends up being, where was my number 2, number 2? Oh, it's right next to it. It's this one here. Okay, and what would I do next? Um, let's see. I would then also look at, instead of the x, the logarithm being negative, I would look at the x being negative, this one here because log base nine of negative X is going to rotate it around the Y axis. So now instead of it going through one zero, it's going to spin like a weather vane and go through the, whoops, this one over here, the zero, negative one zero. Instead of, instead of one zero, it's negative one zero. And that one is this one here. That one there, boop. And I'm, I know I'm at 5.15, but I just wanna finish up this example. And then if I went to this one in blue, this one is both the pink one. This, this was the pink graph here and then this negative sign did the, the green graph. So it's gonna flip it to the pink and then it flips it again. Um, so it flips it around the x-axis and then it flips it around the y-axis. So that my final graph for that is going to be, it's like you're going from yellow to pink and then pink flips over and it's gonna shoot going to go like this. So I'm looking for that one going through and that would be this graph right here. That's this one. Baloo. And narrowing them down. Let's see what else we got here. Um, this one is the basic yellow function of log base nine of X, but then they add on to that a minus one. That's going to take the purple graph and drop it down. Sorry. That's going to take the yellow graph and drop it down one. So here's the original yellow, right? That's this part, log base nine of X, but then with the purple, it is going to drop it from here to here. And now it's going to look like that. So instead of going through one zero, it'll go through one negative one, which would be this one right here. This one. It's going through this point right here, which is one negative one. So it's this graph. <sighs> okay, and then what else have I got? Um, this one has the minus one inside the parentheses. So that's going to be the horizontal shift and it'll go one, but because it's a negative one, it'll go one to the right. 
So starting at the yellow, I'm going to shift the yellow one to the right, which will move it to here. So instead of the y axis being the asymptote, now the vertical line x equals one is, and it goes through two zero, which would be this point right here. That's two zero, and my asymptote has moved over. And I'm down to two. I got a 50 50 shot at this. Oh, let's go gray. Um, let's see. I looked at this one here, but I rewrote it as negative log base nine of x plus one. For the negative on the outside, it's going to flip the yellow graph around the x axis, which is really now the pink one. But then the plus one is going to move it up one unit. So it's going to look like the pink, but up one. So it's got to be this one because the pink is going like this, but it did move it up one. So by the process of elimination, the only one I have left is this guy here. So that has to be this one. That's my last one. All right, and I am done for the day. We will finish this up next time. I've got quite a few and cover whatever's next on the agenda. Whew. Anybody still out there? Yes, I still have seven people hanging in there. Woohoo! You guys got any questions? If not, sayonara. Hasta la vista. Ciao. Adios. I'm ending this. Go eat some dinner. <laughs>